time I come up those steps, I'm reminded of years ago when I was preaching in Leonard. I only had one step, and I was coming down the steps as the invitation was being offered, and I I caught my heel on the edge, and I slipped, and I fell, and I hit the floor, and later one of my friends, my good friends, said, did you have a nice trip? And, uh, you know, as I think about that, when I come into the pulpit, it is one of the greatest trips that I could ever take. Opportunity to come and proclaim the gospel and take this opportunity to share together uh, the, the praise and devotion that we have toward God and that we, that we might grow closer and closer and closer to Him. And as we do, we are drifting further and further away from the world. And that is what God wants for each of us. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you are welcome and wanted right here at West Hill. If you're looking for a church home, look no further than the family that is here. We want to be with you and we want you to be with us as we work together to go toward heaven. As we draw closer to that Savior who wants to save us. And if you're traveling or passing through, we welcome you. And as you go and you see your friends and your families, tell them about West Hill. So that they're in Corsicana at other times that they may be able to come and visit with us as well. We've heard them all our lives, their sayings about crying. Things like, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to, as the old song says. Well, there's no use of crying over spilled milk. The idea that we don't weep and mourn of the things that already passed. Or someone says, well, cry me a river. As if their problems are worse than than the one that's telling them. Big girls or big boys don't cry. Laugh and the whole world laughs with you. Cry and you cry alone. Crying is such a natural part of the human experience. That we on this earth at times are going to be brought low over loss and loneliness and discouragement or disappointment and despair and depression and on and on and on. The pain, the list of pains go and we know that that in those moments the natural response of the human body is to cry. It's who we are as a human race that crying is something that we face every day and every time that we are brought low. But it seems that in this world, most people try to avoid sadness and sorrow and crying. This is evidenced by the fact that everywhere around us we see amusement, entertainment, pleasure, thrill-seeking, anything that would distract us and our hearts from looking at the world and becoming discouraged or just depressed or saddened and sorrowed with grief over what is happening around us. And against this backdrop of constant entertainment and the I- ignoring of a broken heart and the symptoms of sadness, God has placed a different plan for Christianity. Against that backdrop of constant entertainment, God has a life to be lived differently by those who are his children. A life, in fact, that stands in stark contrast to the world and its carnalities and its its ways of the flesh in seeking the vices and the sins of this world. Last week we began a new series asking that question about if God wrote my bucket list... So today we're going to continue that same idea as we look at the the bucket list, really, that God has written for us. That declaration that we make that God wrote my bucket list. Our bucket list, we say, would contain those, those goals and aspirations that we view in this life as the most important to be accomplished before we you know, kick the bucket, before we die and leave this world, what is it that we see as the most important things in the world? Seeks accolades and renowns. We're, we're going to go uh, to far places and reach high mountains and, and we're going to meet certain people and we're going, to, we're going to register in this life. We're going to leave a mark behind. But when God writes our bucket list, those things which are most important to Him are often the most least important to the world. And as we think about God's list 
of happiness, the things that he has for us. We, we're looking at Matthew 5 and what we refer to as the Beatitudes because each one starts with the word happy or in our language or in our Bibles, most of them start with blessed, which, which means happy. Happy are those, and we saw last week, happy are those who are poor in spirit. It is at the very top of God's list of happiness and the most important goals and aspirations that any one of us in this world could ever attain. It is not the heights of Mount Everest, but it is the heights of poverty in the spirit. It's interesting because God starts with, in order for us to be happy, truly happy, we have to start at the very bottom, poor in spirit. The idea of poverty of spirit is that we realize that sin is a humiliation. Hence, brought low, poor in spirit, because we are humiliated by our sins. You know, I know a lot of times when we do something that's dumb, or we do something that's silly, or especially if we do something that, that we know we're not supposed to do, what do we often try to do? We hide it. We hide it because we don't want to th my neighbor to think any less of me. I, I don't want my, uh, my uh, employers to think less of me. I don't want my spouse to think less of me. And, and the point that Jesus is getting across with poor in spirit is, you should already think so less of yourself that no one else could possibly think lower than you. That's poor in spirit. Not because of our self-esteem is hurt or because we feel like we're inadequate in, uh, to, to measure up to what the world thinks we ought to do, but because we have sin. That's what sin does to us. It humiliates us. It brings us low. And instead of treating sin as a light thing, we need to understand how low it does bring us. It brings us the wage of death. And then we can empty ourselves of the worth that the world gives us so that God can fill us with his spirit and the worth that is meet for his kingdom. Yeah. That's the greatest things, or one of the greatest things that we can aspire to before we die. Secondly, in, in his list though, we turn our focus to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4 in which Jesus in this great sermon on the mount comes to the second in the list of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Happy, he says, are those who mourn or more succinctly we would say happy are the sad. And once again, we are hit immediately in the face by the paradox of Christianity. How is it possible that if I am brought low in humiliation and I am saddened in my heart that I could possibly be happy? Well, let's look at that. Let's look at sorrow from the world's perspective and from God's perspective and then see what true happiness and comfort is when it comes from God's sorrow. We begin with the idea of worldly sorrow. From the earth's perspective, many have tried to explain how or what Jesus means in blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Most people come to the conclusion that when people see us in sadness and sorrow and grief, when they see that our hearts are brought low and the tears are flowing quite freely, that they in empathy will come to our side and wrap arms around us and cheer us up. Brighter days are ahead. Or they will encourage us and we will simply feel better knowing that there are others around me who care about me. Maybe the whole world doesn't cry with me, but I, I have friends and I have loved ones who when I'm weeping, they notice and they will cry along with me. And in those moments, I will be comforted. There's a lot of people who come to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4 and even quote it on, on uh, decoupage and things, uh, decorations of the house to remind us that when, when life has got us down that, that we are going to be comforted by those of the world or even comforted by God. But that's not really what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is not saying that every tear we will cry will ultimately be comforted. That's not necessarily what he's saying. There's all kinds of worldly sorrow which brings grief 
to a broken heart and tears will readily flow, but they're not reasons which would inspire God to comfort us in those moments. Think about, for example, in, in 2 Samuel 13 when Amnon, who was one of the sons of David, who had a half-sister by the name of Tamar, that he, he'd fallen in love with her. And he knew that his love couldn't go any further than this because even though she was beautiful and even though she stirred his heart, it was an illicit love affair. And so he became sullen and sad and weeped over the fact that he could not have her. At no time should we ever think that God sought to comfort that sorrow. In 1 Kings 21, when uh, 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 Ahab saw the, the vineyard of Naboth, one of his neighbors there near the castle, and he, he loved it. It was, it was producing fine grapes. The produce was, was unlike anything else. And he went to Naboth and he said, I love your vineyard. I want to buy it. And Naboth said, no, this is, this is my family's inheritance. It has been in our family since we, the day we walked over across the Jordan River and entered the land. Joshua gave this land to my ancestors and we hold it and cherish it to this very day. And it says that Naboth, or that, that King Ahab, became sullen, vexed. He went to his room and he laid down on his bed and he's pouting and weeping. He's filled with grief and sorrow. That's worldly sorrow. Jesus is not saying when you're crying over, over uh, uh, personal jealousies and over not being able to, to acquire the, the fancies and treasures of this earth, he's not saying we're going to comfort you in those moments. You see, not every tear will be dried by God. Worldly sorrow mourns over guilt. Judas, as in Matthew 27 and verse 3, weeping because he has betrayed the Savior and realized his guilt, he cannot get it far enough away from him. That sorrow will not be comforted. Even in this world, there are some things that, that are natural reactions that, that break our heart and, and are neither good nor bad. The, the death of someone that we love, we might mourn over that. A separation from those that we love, as Paul was in, in Acts chapter 20, going to be separated from the church at Ephesus and the elders there. And it says they wept together that they were, were going to be separated. Uh, he even reminded them how I, I rem admonished you day and night and wept day and night. Acts 20 and verse 31. And so th there's all kinds of weeping in this world and mourning and sorrows. But if we keep Jesus' statement in its context and we look at the, the happiness that comes from the sadness, we understand that it is not, in fact, worldly sorrow that Jesus is talking about. it. He's talking about us. A godly sorrow. And there is a difference between the two. Godly sorrow, we find, is different because it leads to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, For godly grief or sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. There's no reason to turn away from the regret or, or from the salvation and the sorrow that we bear there. Whereas worldly grief or worldly sorrow produces death. Paul identifies worldly sorrow that we've already looked at, which is crying over lust lost. It is crying over treasures not attained. It is crying over personal guilt. It is crying over loss on this earth and the things that will only last for a short time that are not leading to a change of life. That is worldly sorrow, but godly sorrow the sorrow which will be comforted, the sorrow which will bring true happiness, the blessings to the sad is the sorrow that leads to salvation, to our hearts being removed or, or the sin being removed from our hearts that we can stand whole before God. In the New Testament, there are, there are nine different words that the Greeks used to identify sorrow and sadness. You think about the ancient Greek tragedies and, and, and all the ways that they would describe how pain and heartbreak, love lost, unrequited love, 
death and all of these different kinds of pain and grief, but it seems that each, each one was more poignant than the last. Here Jesus uses what is considered the strongest word for sorrow and mourning. It is the one that indicates not the superficial outward wailing of a person such as crying, but it is that inward, uh, heartbroken, man-separated-from-God mentality that it is the heaviest burden to bear. It, it is, they are the, the bitterest tears to cry. They are the sharpest pains that we would know. And that's the word in which Jesus said, Happy are those who mourn. Happy are those who are stabbed deeply by pain and sorrow. And it kind of gives us insight into what Jesus is talking about. This was the word that was reserved for pain over the death of a close companion. Like a piece of your heart has been cut out of your chest and thrown upon the ground and stomped it on. That's the morning, he says. The poor in spirit are humbled by their sins, and this leads them to mourn over their spiritual condition. Their heart is ripped from their chest. Why? Because we are spiritually dead. You who are you're dead in your trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2 and verse 1. That wage of sin, which is death, Romans 6 and verse 23. Look at these two men who stood that night on the day, on the night that Jesus was, was betrayed. As Jesus is going through the mockery of a trial, standing before Pilate and standing before the high priest and back before Pilate again, and they just, they can't quite get together on how to bring Jesus down that particular evening. There are two men who are watching those events unfold. Two have very similar responses. But the two eventually has very different outcomes. The one is Judas. Who as he realizes that this is really happening. I have betrayed the man that I, I followed for three and a half years. I have betrayed the one that so many times I called my Lord. Sometimes I, I may have meant them and sometimes not, but he is an innocent man. He is so overcome by his grief that he even tries to buy that pardon. He takes his money that he's received from the Pharisees and the chief priests and he takes it back to him and he says, I, I, I can't have this anymore. These 30 pieces of silver are to me a mark of my betrayal. Take away my guilt. Take it back. And the priest looked at him and they said, what, what do we have to do with you? Judas, weeping, sorrowed. It's as if his heart has been cut out and he runs out and he hangs himself. And the same night, there's another drama that is playing out by another man who is watching Jesus in the trials. Except Peter is warming himself by the fires in the courtyard of, of the, the, the patios where Jesus is being tried. And someone comes to him and says, you're, you're one of them. And Peter says, no, not me. And later, another one comes and says, Aren't, you're a Galilean just like they are. Your speech betrays you. No, not, not me. And a third time, someone comes and, and accuses him. And he says, man, I, I do not know what you're talking about. And in that moment, the rooster crowed. And it says, Peter turned and looked at the Lord. And what I see when I read it is one of the most heartbreaking, heart-wrenching moments in the Bible. It's as if Peter is looking to Jesus and wondering, did, did he hear the rooster crow? Do you, do you think he heard what I said? Was he so distracted by the trial that he's forgotten about what he said to me? That three times you will deny me before the morning, crow, ro or, 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 the morning rooster crows? Let me see if he happened to notice. And in the midst of the trial, when Jesus is... When he's being accused of crimes he's not committed, 
And you would think that his heart is most focused on his, his own grief and his own sorrow in that moment. He turns and looks at Peter as if to say, I know. I know. And Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Peter's sorrow led to repentance. Judas' sorrow led to his regret. And now those two men from that night who saw the same drama and had some of, the, some of the same reaction of sorrow and grief and tears will be separated by eternity in heaven and hell because of the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. So what is it that brings this true comfort? You know, Jesus wants every Christian to know that the happiness that comes from God cannot begin until the happiness that comes from sin ends. We've got to stop our sin and our love affair with sin before we can tr gain the true happiness that comes from God. I'm not talking about being sinlessly perfect. I'm talking about changing our attitudes towards sin. That is the definition of repentance. Metanoeo, to change the mind about sin. John tells us that it will bring forth fruits. It will produce a lifestyle that is different, but it begins with the change of attitude. People living in sin love their deeds. Or people living in sin sometimes take no thought about the moral value of their actions. They just don't think about it. It's easier not to think about it for a lot of people. Why, if I start to think about it, I might feel bad about what I'm doing. If they do consider how does this affect God, they often try to, to minimize its effect on their lives. Or they say, well, I'm a sinner. God's grace is going to take care of it. It's almost as if they're asking the Apostle Paul to say, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6 and verse 1, God forbid. Let that not be our attitudes. Sin is destructive. It is not to be taken lightly. There are some who in their sin take comfort in the idea of, well, at least I'm not as bad as my neighbor. Or why Joe, Sue, and Billy Bob are doing the same things that I'm doing or they're doing it even worse. Or the idea that the world now is more accepting of my behavior or my lifestyle and therefore things must be fine. The devil is planting the idea in their mind that sin is okay. And because there's pleasure in sin, they find more pleasure from that sin than they find pleasure in pleasing God. David tried to deal with his sin himself. And he, in Psalm 32, and if, if, if you're holding your Bible and I haven't told you to turn anywhere yet, but turn here, Psalm 32, and we're going to wrap up just a few verses here. In Psalm 32, beginning in verse 3, David says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat of summer. David says, There's, I, 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 was, I was wearing out. It became wearisome when I was doing what? I wasted away when I kept silent. He was trying to hide his sin from the world. He was trying to deal with it himself. Uh, this isn't going to bother anybody else. And he was holding it in. He had faced the loss of his children. He had faced uh, 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 his friends leaving him and betraying him. He had faced his children fighting against him. Nothing broke his heart and wore him out more than keeping silent about his sin. That was the godly sorrow in David. His bones were wasting away. Like David, 
when we hide our sins or we try to ignore our sins or justify them, it becomes wearisome. But David eventually found rest. Notice verse 5 and 6. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity, and I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The day that it finally clicked that I cannot take care of my own sins, but I must turn to God. He said, I, I acknowledged my sins, and I quit hiding. I quit trying to cover them up. And there was sweet release and salvation for David in that moment. It's simple, really. Only when we cry over our sins do we show true godly sorrow that will lead to repentance and salvation. And only then can we receive the kingdom. In verse 3, Matthew 5 and verse 3. Only then can we receive that kingdom. And when we receive that kingdom because we were penitent, because we were brought by godly sorrow to repentance from the grief over my sin, only in that moment will the gift of God's comfort come to us. And out of that comfort will come eternal happiness. Oh, I know, we look at the world around us and we lament. We wring our hands over the sin and the debauchery and the, the progression that the world has taken. We look at ourselves and, and we recognize how far we have fallen from God's ideal. But let us leave here this morning knowing that the, true, the truly happy people are the sad people. Sad because of their sins. Look how David actually began Psalm 32 in verse 1 and 2. When he says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whom the spirit, or there is no spirit or, or no deceit. David recognized that true happiness came when his sins were finally forgiven. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Happy are the sad. Blessed are those who have changed. So we're making our bucket list. But we're not doing it ourselves. God is writing it for us. And God says, on your list, child, put a mournful heart. Are you mourning this morning? the weight of your sin the sorrow and the grief that you feel from your separation from God is it weighing on you you know God wants you to feel that sorrow because ultimately he wants you to know his happiness God wants you to be happy and it begins right here at the bottom with that poor spirit who is now sorrowing and weeping over the spiritual condition do you know such sorrow this morning Estranged from the God who created you and loves you and has given his son for you. Are you estranged and feel that sorrow, the guilt of sin, the remorse of what you have done, that stabbing pain like they felt on the day of Pentecost? And they said, what shall we do? The answer to your pain, the answer to my pain, is the same as it has been since the day of the cross. If you believe that happiness is possible, but it's only possible through Jesus, then would you fix your eyes on him in faith this morning? Pointing your heart and your ever being toward him. Repenting of those sins. Allow that godly sorrow to cause you uh, to repent, to, to change your life and your attitude towards sin. Confess Jesus as the Savior and be baptized for the remission of your sins and Jesus himself will wash them away. Yeah. Comfort, true comfort. Not like what the world can give, but what God gives. If this morning you're saying, oh, wretched man that I am, won't you come to the forgiveness that God offers to you? Won't you respond while we sing this morning?